now. <laughs> okay, am I am I good to go, Kushek? Okay, great. Okay, so um, having, having read all of your applications, okay, plus a lot more, I have to tell you I am acutely aware that I'm talking about things that uh, you don't know very much about and you may not be terribly interested in, okay? And so uh, I, I face a rather daunting task here, but I'll give it my best shot. Uh, I know that I have to tell you about Lattice, uh, what is it, okay? Uh, and then I have to find interesting things about it to tell you, okay? And I'm going to do that uh, in a series of big pictures, you know, starting with really, really big pictures and then getting smaller and smaller. And I'm going to try to avoid technical details. And for the lot of people who are sitting in the back of the room smiling, you're wondering, what the hell am I going to talk about, okay? Because Lattice is all about technical details. But, you know, if you think about it, every other subject here is about technical details. Um, it's just that, you know, these are my, okay. So technical details are incredibly boring, okay? So what is the lattice? That's pretty simple, okay? So you have, say, some fields phi of x, and what you do is you replace, you put an index on x, and you have a set of fields that are defined on a grid, okay? And your partition function, which was uh, d phi e to the minus s of phi, okay, functional integral just becomes uh, an integral over all of your sites uh, d phi at x i e to the minus uh, s of phi. That's pretty much all there is. You could play the same game with a Hamiltonian, right? You could take a Hamiltonian which is, I don't know, dtx uh, Hamiltonian density and replace it by, right, a sum over terms. That's all that lattice is. And the grid could be regular, it could be irregular, it could be random, it can be anything you want. Okay? Um, I'm going to assume that it's a regular grid and our first bit of lattice jargon, I'm just going to assume that it's a, a cube or a hypercube or something like that and the spacing between the grid points, lattice jargon, that's the lattice spacing, I'm going to call that A. Okay, I'm going to assume that things are regular. So, why in the world would you want to do something like this? Okay, um, well, there's several reasons. The first one is maybe your problem really lives on a grid. Okay, if that's the case, probably you don't want to be at Tassie, you want to be at the Boulder School next month. Okay, so we'll push that aside. Okay, so you're here. So, why would you want to do this? Okay. Well, the reason is that you have a problem and you want to simplify it, okay? And you're willing to put off thinking about space-time symmetries. They're not so important to you, okay? What you're really focused on are internal symmetries like global transformations or gauge symmetry. You don't care about space-time symmetries, or at least you're willing to ignore them for a little while. You are willing to live with an ultraviolet cutoff. Maybe you want an ultraviolet cutoff. If you don't, well, you know, you'll, you can live with it. And maybe you're even willing to live with an infrared cutoff if the number of points in your grid uh, is finite. Okay? And you'll have to deal with all these things, but, you know, we're, we're all going to die. We can, you know, we can put things off until tomorrow. Okay? So what do you get when you do that? Okay? So you get three things. Thing number one, and at least for people in my generation, this was pretty important. I don't know about you guys. You get an ultraviolet cutoff that has no connection to perturbation theory. That's, that's pretty interesting, okay? Um, second thing, sometimes you get non-perturbative insight, okay? Um, the whole story about confinement for gauge theories, okay? Wilson's story, long, long ago, came from thinking about gauge theories on a lattice. In 2010, one of the first lecturers was uh, Subir Sakdev, the, the condensed matter physicist at Harvard. And he gave this whole lecture on the Hubbard model. Okay, for those guys, that, that's a model of four Fermi interactions on a lattice. Okay, I mean, everything was a Hubbard model. Okay, and so you learn things sometimes. 
And the third thing you get when you play this game, sometimes, is you get access to numerical simulations. Okay? Uh, and this doesn't depend on the particular kind of theory that you're studying or the number of dimensions or anything like that. It's a general method for attacking complicated quantum field theories. Okay, this is an old game. Okay? I, when I was writing these lectures, I was thinking, uh, this stuff is like 40 years old, okay, older. And if you're a condensed matter physicist, even older than that. And I was imagining. So they didn't have TASI when I was in graduate school. I went to a summer school in Erechek in 1974, and we had people like uh, Etuft and Wilson lecturing. And I was thinking, what if there had been lectures at Erechek in 1974 on the compound nucleus? I'll let you look that up later. I mean, it was the same sort of thing. Okay, that, okay you know what compound nucleus was. Oh, you won't. You'll find out. Okay, so why should you listen? It's not your field. Okay? Well, uh, you should listen for a couple of reasons. One, there's a lot of useful techniques. We had a visitor. We had uh, John McGreevy here uh, at the end of April. He was a lecturer at TASI 15. He does ADS-CM stuff. And he was giving this talk, and most of it was string theory, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of it, he was simulating the Ising model. Okay? So then, you know, he's, he's, he's one of you. Okay? So he was doing this stuff. Okay? <laughs> Second thing, there's a lot of problems where you might be able to do a lattice calculation, or better still, you might be able to find some lattice person and convince that lattice person that your problem is interesting. Okay, and get them to no, and get them to do it for you. Okay, um, and it's good to know what we can do and what we can't do. Okay, before you do something like that, um, I was imagining that I would be giving lectures in the third week of TASI. You'd all be getting tired. Uh, you know, I could kind of skim over things, but there was stuff that you had seen before. Now I'm giving lectures in the first week, and so now you can watch as we go on. Okay. Are there things that somebody like me could do in the next three or four weeks? Well, if there are, uh, send me an email when you get home, okay? Or do it yourself. Lattice, when you get down to it, is a mix of a whole bunch of things. It's a mix of renormalization group, effective field theory, some phenomenology. Uh, when you get deeper into it, a lot of software engineering. There are even the people that do hard that build computers to do this stuff. Um, the subject itself is probably as broad as or broader than what's in any other lecture series at TASI. Okay? Um, so I'll have to be very careful how I talk about things. Along the way, I'm going to say a lot about QCD. Okay? Um, QCD, um, I love QCD. QCD has a great advantage over many other theories that you might want to study, okay? and that it really exists. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Harry Leutwiller said that QCD with massless fermions was the most perfect theory that there was because it has no parameters. Right? Set the quark masses to zero and then look at QCD and you have dimensional uh, transmutation, right? You get the scale and then you get basically, you know, enormous spectrum, all of nuclear physics, big chunks of particle physics out of nothing. Okay? That's pretty impressive. Uh, okay? Um, okay, so that's one reason I'm going to talk a lot about it. The other thing is that these days, 90% of lattice people work on QCD. Okay, I mean, that's a place where we can make a living. And I have to say also that lattice QCD is probably the most successful program in particle theory since the discovery of the standard model in terms of making predictions that uh, are relevant for experiment or are relevant for you know, why are, you know, why is the world the way it is? Okay? So, that's why I'm going to talk, I'm going to mention it as we go along. It's something you should know about. But, it's a technical subject. Okay? Most lattice literature is about how to do something efficiently. Okay? And that's not something which is appropriate for you. Okay? Because you're probably not going to do it. Okay? It's better to focus on the big picture and try to leave out as many details as I can, okay, and do a skim, okay? Um, I've got notes posted. They're more or less what's going to get on, go on the archive at some point. I'll, I'll revise them as we go along. I gave a list of good books to read right at the start of it, so there's a literature you can look at. The problem with all the books that are out there is that they assume that you want to do something right out of the box. So chapter one or chapter two is 
bitty, bitty, bitty. Here's how we start calculating. Oh, we have to do this. We have to do this. We have to. And it's not really about why should you want to do it. What, what's the big picture? What can you do? So I'm going to try to say simple things. Okay. One thing that I have to tell you, I mean, I've probably worked on a broader set of lattice problems than most people who do lattice. That doesn't mean I was successful at it, but it, at least I'm well read. Okay. So you can ask me, you know, what about the abelian Higgs model? Well, okay. Here's the, you know, the following people did the following things. People like me, when we're doing when we're doing our jobs, okay, and when we're talking about it, um, we're always thinking about how can I actually compute something, and that's behind everything I'm going to tell you. Okay, I'm always worrying. You, you know, you okay. So it looks like I'm presenting something here, but I'm always when I'm talking about something, I got to code this up. Okay, in my line of work, you you it does it's not good enough to have a brilliant idea and publish the brilliant idea. You got to code it up and make it work. Okay? It's like being an experimentalist. Okay? And that's always behind things. Uh, yeah. Um, I was thinking this morning, okay, you know, all the guys who are lecturing and they're talking about things that are completely different from what I'm going to talk about, but there's a lot of stuff which is the same in there. Okay? So I'm going to be visiting things that you've seen before uh, and I'll talk about them in my own way. Um, and um, maybe there are versions of these stories in your research that you know that I don't know. We'll have the cocktail party tonight, and you, you can tell me about them. Um, if I'm telling you something which sounds very obvious, but I'm putting a little twist on it, uh, a lot of times the things I'm telling you, uh, people in my line of work did it first, okay? And so it's a little bit like reading the Old Testament in Greek, okay? <laughs> you know, there's, maybe there's stuff there that uh, this is where it started. Okay, so outline. Okay, so I'm giving four lectures, and what I want to talk about today <laughs> is basics. Okay, so I want to talk about how we put gauge fields on the lattice, why we do the things that we do. Okay, uh, I want to try to talk about the Wilson loop as, uh, as, a, as an order parameter for confinement, because that's what's interesting to us. Okay? And then what I want to talk about is how you get rid of the lattice spacing. Okay? We take a very peculiar point of view toward ultraviolet completions, because we're all the time writing them down. Okay? And we know they're fake. Okay? So this will be, I'll try to talk about this today. Okay? So that'll be kind of the beginning. Second thing I want to do um, is to walk you through how lattice calculations are done. And this is probably the most important uh, lecture that I'll give you because you have to know what are the strengths and the weaknesses of some calculation scheme. I'm worried about this because this could be the most boring lecture. Okay? So, okay, don't run away if, if it is. Okay? Uh, I'll give it my best shot. And then I want to start doing case studies. Okay? Um, and I sort of have an idea for three case studies. Um, one of them is kind of formal. I want to talk about chiral fermions on the lattice. This sounds like kind of a crazy subject. Um, but it turns out that it's, it's our version, our particle physics version of topological insulators and topological order. Okay? Um, the, literature, the lattice literature almost never uses the word topological, but that doesn't matter. It's there. Okay? And I think that there are things that we know that the people who do topological insulators don't know. I'm not certain about that. I know that there are things that they know that we don't know. But this will, no, I'm serious. This will, um, so this will kind of set the stage for uh, Max's lectures. And then I wanted to look at a couple of real case studies. Um, and one of them is to look, actually look at QCD. And um, 
most lattice people, they would say, oh, QCD, okay, so I can do a lattice calculation, and bitty, 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 and the, the result is this, and I calculated it. You know, a lot, of, a lot of theoretical physics is like that. You know, where does it come from? Well, I did the calculation, that's the answer. I want to try to avoid that. I want to try to give you a big picture view of confining theories, okay? There is a big picture view of confining theories, and you should know what it is if you don't know what it is already. Okay, um, and then, uh, and this is inspired by David Simmons Duffin's lectures uh, four years ago. Uh, the conformal bootstrap guys, uh, at least then, were uh, doing conformal bootstrap and calculating the critical indices of the 3D Ising model. Uh, it turns out there are Monte Carlo calculations of the critical indices. They're not quite so good as the, but, uh, but who cares, okay? <laughs> because, because the experimental data is, is 10 times worse than the Monte Carlo, okay? And, okay, so I thought, and, and this will illustrate what you do with confining theories, and this will illustrate how we deal with, um, I'm afraid to say. I mean, these are these are theories at the critical po at their critical points. I'm afraid to use language because, you know, I I don't know. Is it conformal? You know, it's an Ising model at criticality. Okay. Um, so this is how we uh, this is how we analyze critical behavior in simulations. Okay. So this is the outline right here for what I want to do. And um, okay. Good. So how do you do it? How do you do lattice calculations? Okay, so let's first of all think about systems that have global symmetries. Um, these are trivial to throw on the lattice, right? A global symmetry is you have some phi of x and you rotate everybody uh, the same amount, right? That's a global symmetry. Well, that's easy to put on the lattice. You just put an index on phi of x, and then uh, maybe you know you have a Lagrangian. Maybe you re and so you replace derivatives by finite differences. There's nothing else to do. That's the yeah, that's the end of it right there. Okay, until the next lecture when we actually have to do something. Okay, not much to say. Global symmetries. Well, let, let's sort of be faux naive here, right? A global symmetry is phi of x goes to v of x, phi of x, okay? And so the issue is that if you measure some expectation value, say phi, huh? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, phi dagger of x phi of y. So you look at some correlator like this, right? And this is equal to phi dagger at x, v of x, say dagger, v of y, phi of y. And this could be anything, right? And this could be anything. So this could be anything. So what's the expectation value equal to? Yeah, exactly. So you don't have any dynamics, right? Right. I mean, that's the usual problem with local symmetries. Okay, and um, so of course, you know, this is the story that we all, you know, that you get in, you know, the second semester of Jackson or first semester QFD or something like that. You have to add uh, new degrees of freedom to the gauge theory in order to have interesting dynamics. This is even a, there's even a theorem called Elitzer's theorem, which says, which lattice people my age know about, that say expectation values of gauge non-invariant quantities are zero. Okay, it's kind of an obvious theorem, but okay, Mr. Elitzer's name is attached to it. Okay, so for a gauge theory, of course, you need new uh, degrees of freedom. Okay, so we scratch our head for a little bit and we get out our textbook. Right, it's a continuum textbook, but we're going to go on the lattice in a little bit right here. And you remember uh, how things work, right? Uh, you think about parallel transport, and you say, oh, 
uh, if I want to take some field and drag it around, right, I have to attach uh, a path ordered exponential, say a dot dl, as I go from uh, x to y onto my variable, and this is how I carry my, you know, this is how I parallel transport, uh, you know, my internal information around as I go running around on the lattice, okay? Or running around in, you know, in the room. We're not on the lattice yet. Let's write this as u of x comma y phi y, right? This is phi of x, rather, uh, y of x. I stopped lecturing three weeks ago, and everything went dead on me until uh, y comma x phi x, OK? So I've got this u thing right here, which is carrying uh, gauge information from point to point on the lattice, OK? And this was my definition of a gauge transformation on my matter fields on phi of x. And you all know the game. What you do is you expand your definition of local gauge invariance to include not just you know, locally rotating the phase of your matter fields every place in space, to rotating the front and the back end of this thing which is carrying the information around on the lattice, u of y comma x, at the same time that I'm rotating the phi fields up here, v of y, u of y comma x, and then we rotate backwards on, on the beginning, on the beginning of, on the other end of this thing. And these two things right here are my definition for a local gauge transformation. This is all stuff you know. I'm just doing it in a kind of a, kind of a dopey way right here. So the idea would be that something like phi dagger at y, uh, u of y comma x phi of x is a uh, gauge invariant quantity because I can I rotate this guy I anti rotate this guy v v dagger is one block block right <coughs> QFT one okay so the story is that if you want to talk about gauge fields right you have to have variables uh, that are like these u variables right here you have to get Things that look like this fellow right here, right, into your path integral. So Wilson said, well, here's my lattice right here, right, with my lattice spacing. Let's work with variables that carry me from place to place, and they carry me over the minimum distance, OK? So let's imagine that we have a location x here and a location x plus mu. So let's say this is the mu direction, this is the nu direction. So I have some variable, uh, the u, which carries me over the minimum distance that I have. That's going to be my dynamical variable, OK? These are the length variables, u mu of x. That's a variable which is defined on the lengths of the lattice, which is doing kind of the minimum parallel transport for me. Okay, these are the uh, these are the length variables. Uh, we have to define them so that if I go the opposite direction, uh, say u minus mu of x plus mu. So I'm standing right here, going to the left. Uh, that's equal to this guy. Going this way and this way are just the Hermitian conjugates of each other. Okay, that's just a, a thing, kinematical thing right there. And these guys right here, they are elements of your gauge group. These would be our fundamental dynamical variables. Elements of the gauge group, minimum length things, okay, uh, there they are. They're just the group elements. If you have, so you could do this for any gauge group. Uh, toric code, right? That's Z2, right? I mean, you could have a Z2 gauge theory. I, toric code is Hamiltonian, but never mind, okay? Um, in the, the things I'm used to dealing with, of course, we could write 
we could just write u mu of x in terms of the vector potentials, say e to the i g, we have to have a lot of spacing to get the units right, a mu at x or something like that, right? You could relate, relate an element of the group uh, to somebody that lives in the algebra. This is the usual thing that you would do for, uh, and let's say a a t a, let's put a generator on there just to show I can do mathematics, okay? And um, so the idea is, again, that with some fellow like this, these guys transform under Gates transformations, right? This is somebody that connects this site to this site right here, okay? So under a Gates transformation, a u mu at x, right, it goes from one point to another point on the lattice. You rotate one, you know, one way on the back end and another way on the front end. So a Gates transformation would be, let's say, v of x, u mu at x, v dagger, x plus mu, something like that, right? I, I, it's a convention. Half the books on lattice gauge theory take this as their convention, the other half put the daggers on the other side. But physically, of course, you know, you have this object that's got two ends, and you rotate one end one way, and you rotate the other end the other way. All, I'm, it's really simple. Okay, you're all looking at me like it's really simple, but that's good. You know, it's been a long day. You've had three lectures. You need something simple. Okay, and so um, the path-ordered exponential, this p e to the i dot 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 is very simple. You just have some path laid out on your lattice. Okay, okay. Here's here's my path, and all you do is you multiply the links together as you walk along the path. That would be the that's the path-ordered exponential. Just take the product of the of the minimum length variables, multiply them along head to tail, head to tail, head to tail. That's your path-ordered exponential, okay? And um, so what are gauge-invariant objects? Gauge-invariant objects are things, say, where you have a matter field at one end, and then you have a product of u's that connect them. So it would look something like this, where I can put, a, say, a psi right here, uh, say, a psi bar right here, and a psi right here. Or there's another possibility. Active learning. Yes, exactly. Okay. Another possibility is I take a product of u's and I go around some path, okay, bitty bitty bitty, around some path, around some path, around some path, and then I come back to where I started. So I have a product of, say, a uh, product of u's around a closed path, and in order to make them invariant, I trace. Okay. The trace of a product of u's around some closed path. Okay. Right. Trace uh, u1, u2, un, and that's gauge invariant because I have a v here, and I have a v dagger, and a v, and then I have a v dagger over here, and cyclic properties of trace, right? All very simple. Blip. It's gauge invariant. Okay. So these are the gauge invariant objects that I can work with. These are the interesting things for me, the lattice person. And you can see I'm realizing, you know, Wilson loops and stuff. I haven't come to Wilson loops yet. We'll get that out in a second. But these closed paths of things, right? Yeah, I mean, you guys use this stuff too. This is where, but this was first. Okay. Um, good. Yeah. Oh, and finally, uh, what do you need? Okay. So you have to integrate over these guys. So I've got all my variables right here. When I do my functional integral, I've got to integrate over them. Well, they're elements of the group, right? So invent a gauge theory for me. How do I integrate over these guys? Har measure, right? Just invariant integration over the group space. That's all there is. That's a lattice gauge theory, OK? Um, yeah. So. So what I have here, you know, for my for my for my measure, is just product over all mu and x, and I have invariant integration over the over the group space. All very simple. Uh, if you own the right quantum field theory book, this is you know this is the chapter on quantization of gauge fields. Okay, except we don't talk about Fedeya Popov yet. Okay, good. So so that's that's basically how a gauge theory works. Okay. Um, now we need something else. Erase this. So we need an action. Okay. So
So somebody tell me what a good action would be while I'm erasing all this stuff. No? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the action. Okay. So if you took any closed loop that lived in a plane, okay, this thing will look like f mu nu squared. Okay. Um, any closed loop that doesn't live in a plane will look like derivatives of f mu nu. Okay. So an action for a gauge theory will be a sum of traces over closed loops of the u's. Okay. Let's look at the simplest choice. Okay, um, this has a name. It's called the plaquette, or it's called the Wilson action. Mr. Wilson uh, appears frequently in these lectures. Okay, when you trace on it. Yeah, yeah. Is the yeah, yeah exactly, exactly, yeah. And I'm sure you can find special cases where that ain't so, but they're not the ones I work on. Okay, um, there's a small literature on Sharon Simons on the lattice, which is very messy. Uh, it's even smaller than the literature of instantons on the lattice, which is very messy. Look, we'll, uh, you'll be here on Thursday. I'll talk about it. Okay. So Wilson action is the following object. It's a plaquette. Let's say a distance x right here. Let's pick this as direction mu. Let's pick this as direction nu. Okay, and we define our action. This is this is lattice jargon right here. Beta is two uh, n over g squared for s u n. Uh, I sum over all locations x, I sum over all mu greater than nu, so I'm summing over all the plaquettes. I take the real part of the trace of 1 minus p mu nu of x, where p mu nu is the product oriented, let's orient these guys around the loop. Okay. So p mu nu uh, is equal to, let's follow it, u mu of x. That's the horizontal guy on the bottom up there. And then I have to go vertical here at location x plus nu. So this is u nu at x plus mu. And then I have to come back. So that's u mu dagger x plus nu. See how it works. And then I have a u nu, u nu dagger at x. That's the product of loops around, uh, around the minimum plaquette. Um, naive continuum limit, to show that you get f mu nu. Here's a homework problem for you. I'll do a few lines and then you can check this. This is such a triviality, you can even do it when you get tired of listening to me, right? So the naive continuum limit, u mu of x, okay? So u mu of x is this guy right here. So let's suppose that g a is a small number and we just start Taylor expanding things. u mu of x is 1 plus i g a a mu at x uh, minus 1 half g squared a squared a mu at x squared plus dot dot dot. Okay? And then let's assume that things are smooth. So a mu say at x plus nu Okay, is a mu at x uh, plus a d nu a mu at x plus dot dot dot. Okay, and then so what you do is you expand the exponential for each of the a's. Okay, 
expand the u's into the a's, and then you expand the a's. And what you discover is that this p mu nu that you're going to trace on is 1 plus uh, i a squared f mu nu plus dot, dot, dot. Pause for a second. Cranking out the next order term without mathematics is incredibly annoying, but it's a unitary matrix. And so if I've got the first order, I've got the second order. Okay? And f mu nu is uh, just what you thought it was. d mu a nu minus d nu a mu plus, com plus i commutator a mu a nu. Okay? So that's a perfectly good choice for an action, which Mr. Wilson wrote down. It's the simplest thing you can write down. It's absolutely not unique. Okay, so you should you know, feel queasy for a little while. We'll get back to that. Um, but there it is. Okay, so what that says is, I'm supposed to not use this blackboard right here, that um, beta s uh, is equal to 2 over g squared, sum on x, there's an a to the fourth, there's a sum on mu greater than nu, and there's an a to the fourth uh, where did I? Oh, that's because I wiped. That's because I don't teach in here, and I wiped it out. A squared f mu nu uh, squared a to the fourth f mu nu squared, and you can all take the limit on things. This is called uh, four over g squared uh, d four x, right? F mu nu f mu nu. So in the naive continuum limit, this is a theory. Uh, this is a gauge theory. Okay? Let's write down the partition function for a garden variety gauge theory, just to stare at it and admire it. Okay? So what you do is you integrate uh, du mu of x. Okay? You have these variables defined on the links that live in the group. Okay? You have these group valued variables on all your sites of your lattice, okay? on all your links of your lattice, S product mu and x, e to the minus beta, S of u. Uh, Har measure, gauge invariant, there's your partition function. That's a lattice gauge theory. I'm sure I do. Oh, a to the fourth sum on x. Uh, yes, good. Uh, there we go. Now, now it's right. When did your semester end? Huh? I, I did a core dump in May, OK? Uh, I didn't want to think about it. Oh, uh, more things. Um, notice here that if u is compact, if you have a compact gauge group, okay, um, you can calculate with this guy. You never have to go through all the business of, you know, if a day of pop off, da da da. Okay. On my computer, I regularly simulate with things like this, and I don't, I don't have to gauge fix. Okay, and it's because the u's are compact. The moment I want to do perturbation theory with something like this, right? Perturbation theory, you go back to the A's, okay? And the A's, you know, and you're taking the continue, you're, you're taking A goes to zero and you have all these flat directions and it's a big pain. But so far, I mean, it's a gauge invariant formulation. Uh, there it is, okay? Uh, that's a nice thing. Um, for some calculations, it does, okay? Huh? You should repeat oh, I'm sorry. So, so, so Sasha asks. Um, I, I, Slava says I don't. I sorry. Uh, Slava says uh, I don't have to gauge fix, but do I gauge fix some time? And the answer is yes. There are there are times when I when I gauge fix in order to do calculations. For example, when I want to do spectroscopy. Okay. Let's suppose I want to calculate the mass of a hadron. Okay. So the way you calculate uh, masses in the theory right here is you calculate some two-point function, okay? And you pull the two, you know, you pull the source and the sink apart, and the two-point function will fall off exponentially with distance, and the rate at which it falls off exponentially with distance is the mass, okay? But you want to couple to the lightest state as best you can, and so it's nice to have big puffy operators because that's what hadrons look like, okay? And at least for me, uh, it's my, you know, I know what a big puffy operator looks like in Coulomb gauge. 
So I will go through and I will gauge fix and I will use these things. When I'm generating configurations, uh, typically I don't gauge fix. Okay, uh, That's kind of annoying. It's something else you have to do and you don't have to do it. Yeah, there's a million tricks here. Yeah, Everything, Every statement I tell you, by the way, uh, someone can disagree with. Uh, but a lot of people seem to be very quiet over there. So uh, it's, it's my problem, not yours. OK, so uh, good. So this is a gauge theory right here. So this is, you know, this is section one and section two of 45 years ago, Mr. Wilson. OK? And if that was all that there was, uh, nobody would remember him. OK? So no, uh, what was important in that paper, OK, was that Wilson had a story about confinement, OK? And even now, if you think about it, OK, stories about confinement, Schwinger model, kind of trivial, uh, a Tuff model, large n in two dimensions, uh, Polyakov in three dimensions with monopoles, cyber -Gwitten. Room went quiet. Not a lot out there, okay? And cyber I mean, that's not, you know, that's, that's not in our bodies, okay? Okay? So, uh, maybe in yours. Okay, so, <laughs> so, also, Wilson loop, okay? Wilson loop, where do Wilson loops come from, okay? So, um, Wilson, Wilson's calculation was about confinement and strong coupling. Okay, so let's see. How do you see confinement in strong coupling? Okay, do you people know this story? No one. No one is screaming at me to stop. Okay, so um, so what you want. You'd like to calculate the potential between static quarks. Okay, that's the thing which will tell you whether you have confinement or not. Okay, I want to measure a potential. Okay, so what you do is let's take that partition function over there and let's modify it by considering, right? We'll integrate over the u's uh, e to the minus beta s, but let's add to the system. Let's add, uh, say, the world line of a static quark, OK? J mu, A mu at x, OK? And all of you, right? You're looking at the Wilson loop, right? You know that, OK? This is a partition function in the presence of an external current, OK? Um, what do you know about this integral right here? What do you know about dl? Let's say, let's say dl right here as we go around for something like this. It's a closed path, right? And that's what a Wilson loop is. You know that. Why, physically, why is it a closed path? Do you know that? Why, physically, does the Wilson loop uh, that we're going to use right here describe a closed path? So let's, let's, let's back up. So the current. The current is the current, is the current for a heavy quark. What is the spatial? Uh, dependence of the current for a heavy quark. It's a delta function, exactly. It's a delta function. So there's a delta function in space. Okay? So I'm following this delta function in space and time. Okay? I'm following it around some path. Suppose it just ends. What happened to the current at the point where it ended? It's absolutely, exactly, exactly. The reason it's a closed path right here is because it's a conserved current. That's the physics of the Wilson loop. You have this closed path, which is the world line for the color charge. Okay? So this is uh, d mu j mu is equal to zero is why you have a closed path. Okay? So and it's a delta function, okay? So it's just following some path around like that. And so the Wilson loop, uh, let's pick something, uh, let's say r comma t, and I'll drag, drive a picture for a second. This is just a product 
right? So I have this path ordered exponential, which is going around some path, okay? I'm drawing the little path right here, okay? And let's make it a path which is distance r in one direction and distance t in the other direction. That's the Wilson loop, okay? And it's a product of the link variables uh, running around the path, everybody oriented appropriately, and you trace on it, okay? I mean, you know, you know about, you know, a trace da 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 from what you do. This is the way I would think about it, okay? So, confinement signal. So what you're going to do right here is you're going to say, well, what's the energy of, uh, so now we can, we can visualize this thing. We can imagine, well, this, you know, it's Euclidean time, but what the hell. We can imagine looking here, and uh, this certainly looks like a quark, right, going forward in time, and something, that's an anti-quark because it's going backwards in time. Let's put some arrows here, and some arrows right here, okay? And let's try to turn things into an energy, okay? So the way we can turn things into an energy is I can imagine, what I can imagine doing is I can say, well, I'm looking at the energy of a q to bar pair, and I can look at the energy difference um, between two paths. One of them is where, I mean, they both span a distance L. Let's shorten this guy right here. Here's a distance L. And what I'll do is I'll take one path which runs forward in time a distance t, and I'll take the other path and bring it forward in time a distance t plus delta t. So I'm taking this loop and I'm stretching it a little bit, and I'm asking what's the response of the system to stretching the loop a little bit, okay? And I got a de delta t right here, so obviously I can write this as minus d by dt of, okay, and this is the loop here with the, with the source in it. Uh, sorry, yeah, d by dt, big T, of, well, log z of j. Uh, let's subtract off uh, z of j is equal to 0, just to uh, minus the log of z of j equals 0, so we can get something that's in school books. And this is minus d by dt. Uh, d by dt of the ratio of log z of j divided by z of 0. And z of j is this guy right here. And z of 0 is this guy right here. And so obviously what this is is the matrix element of the Wilson loop. Okay? You calculate the Wilson loop and you take its time derivative and that tells you what the energy of the QQ bar pair is. That's the physics, okay? You guys know all the mathematics because you know about Polyakov loops and Wilson loops and you know Jones polynomial loops and all this stuff. But this is, you know, this is this is the New Testament in Greek. This is what this is what people were doing long ago. Okay. So there's a lot of possibilities for what this thing could do. Okay? So let's go back and think about possibilities. Okay? Um, Some of them you may have done as homework problems, not the interesting ones. Um, so there's a lot of possibilities. Um, one of them is called a perimeter law. Okay? Uh, and that's where W goes like e to, it goes like e to the minus the perimeter. Okay? Well, the perimeter for this thing is 2r plus 2t, so there'll be something like 2r plus 2t. Let me just call the coefficient here m just for the hell of it. Okay? Suppose you had a perimeter law. Uh, if I had a perimeter law, I would say that the energy of the qq bar pair, this is uh, minus d log uh, dw. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, it's the logarithm of the expectation value. So this is equal to uh, I, have to, I have to take a time derivative, so this is 2m. Okay, let's put a minus sign right here and get the minus signs in. Okay? Oh, huh, that's interesting. Energy of the quark is 2m. Energy of a qq bar pair is 2m. Okay? I'm pulling them apart, the energy is 2m, right? m, m. Okay? So a perimeter law, if you, if you were to calculate a Wilson loop and you were to get a perimeter law, uh, this is not a signal for confinement. This is a signal for not confinement. 
Okay, this is just you know this is just the constituent quirk mass or something like that. Uh, Wilson is still not famous for the perimeter law, so let's go for the area law. So an area law. So W goes like e to the minus r times t, right? Because that's the area of the Wilson loop. Let's put a parameter sigma in here. This is confinement. This is e is equal to sigma times r. Okay. So if you if you have a theory and you do a measurement and you measure that the Wilson loop shows an area law, you have a confining theory. This quantity right here is called the string tension. Okay, that's just the word for it. But it's uh, you know the the energy between the two quarks grows linearly as you pull them apart. Okay, that's confinement. Okay, um, in general, okay, you can get all kinds of arbitrary terms. Minus log w in general, you could have a sigma r t term. You could have uh, an m. Uh, times 2r plus 2t. You could have an r over t term. You could have a t over r term. You could keep on going. Okay. Uh, I once had to calculate the Wilson loop in n equals 4, and it's super Yang Mills, and it's uh, if they're if they if if t is very big, it's this guy. Okay. But as long as, but it doesn't matter. Uh, if, you, if you say, do I have confinement or not, the question is, do I have an area law? And the moment I have something like this, when I go to a big enough loop, this guy wins. Okay? All these things are just intermediate things. Okay? So, so the confinement signal for gauge theories is really, really simple, at least to write down. Do I, if I calculate the expectation value of a Wilson loop, do I get an area law? If so, I've got confinement. That's a confinement signal. That'll work for anything. Okay? Okay? All is good? OK. You haven't seen this before? Maybe you're being polite. You don't have to be polite. OK. So um, let's, do, let's prove confinement in strong coupling. OK. So I'm going to tell you a lattice thing. All gauge theories, uh, pure gauge theories, confine in strong coupling. OK. These are gauge theories without matter fields, just any kind of gauge theory. Okay, U1. In fact, I'm going to do U1 uh, because I'm intimidated by all the math I saw this morning. Um, we can do it, uh, and we only have to know two integrals. Okay. So let's do, yeah, let's do confinement. And let's go to U1. OK. Well, uh, an element of U1 is e to the i theta. OK, we saw that this morning. Uh, har measure, du, is the integral d theta over 2 pi from minus pi to pi. OK? Um, trace u plaquette. OK? So we still have it here. It's a product of u's around the plaquette. Uh, u is e to the i theta. So I've got an e to the i theta this way, plus e to the i theta, minus e to the i theta, minus. Okay? And that's going around one orientation. Then when I go around the other orientation, right, I get the opposite sign. So trace up is cosine of theta mu at x plus theta nu at x plus mu minus theta mu x plus nu minus theta nu at x. Okay? That's the trace that's the that's the action right there. And now we have to know two integrals. d theta over 2 pi minus pi to pi is equal to 1. Uh, d theta over 2 pi minus pi to pi e to the i theta is 0. There's probably some fancy group identity for this, like integral u du is 0. 
but I don't know it. This is all we need. Okay? Good. Okay? So these are the integrals that we need. Now I want to calculate the Wilson loop. Okay? So let's have a look at what we've got right here. Uh, yeah. I'm going to work in strong coupling. Okay? Strong coupling is small beta. Right? Beta is uh, 1 over g squared or something like that. So big G is small beta. Okay? So, um, yeah. So I've got beta is much, much less than 1. So I have this e to the beta s. Right? That's my action. Uh, strong coupling. Let's just de-expand the exponential. 1 plus sum over all x mu nu uh, beta trace u mu nu at x plus order beta squared, right? I de this is a sum of terms. I de-expand the enchil. The first term is a sum of terms. The second term is the square of the sum of terms, right? Get a big piece of paper, write it out. Okay. So the partition function, which is the thing we need in the denominator, is the integral du uh, e to the beta s, okay? So I de-expand the exponential. I'm going to start integrating over all the length variables. The first integral gives me 1, right? No, it's, four, it's 440, but we can still do integrals, barely, OK? What about the order beta terms? They're cosine. So they're e to the i theta. So integral number 2 over there says that the next order correction is order beta squared. That's hard, but the order beta stuff is gone. Now, Wilson loop, W of L and T. Okay? So I've got a product here, uh, D theta mu and I over 2 pi. That's my Haar measure. I've got an E to the I around my path, the sum of the thetas. Okay? And then I've got 1 plus beta uh, trace U plus beta squared. Uh, you write sum on x trace u squared out to out to it forever. Okay, so let's evaluate that guy and let's do it by the method of drawing pictures. Okay, remember my integral. Okay, the second integral over there. If I have a dangling phase factor, I get zero, right? Because uh, e to the i theta d theta integrates to zero. So here's my Wilson loop. Okay, this is the L by T Wilson loop. Okay, let me draw some things to help me here. Okay, let me tile over it. Okay, so I'm going to start integrating. I'll draw some arrows here to make my point. So this is the thing whose expectation value I want to take. Okay, and I've de-expanded my exponential up here, and I'm going to start doing integrals. What is the one term? What does the first order term give me? What is the first what does the one term right here in the integral give me? Zero. Okay? Because I'm integrating e to the i theta around the link, and so there's there's an e to the i theta factor associated with integrating over this guy right here. But that gives me 0. Okay? So, so far I've got 0 for the answer. But I have all these terms in the exponential. So let's take a look at this guy right here. So there'll be a term in the exponential where I have a plaquette sitting there, and the plaquette was oriented like this. Okay? I oriented it backwards. So now I can do this integral right here. Because I've got an e to the i theta and an e to the minus i theta. So that gives me a contribution. You can see how it's going. OK, so far so good, except I've got this guy sitting right here. OK, so I can't go order beta. I've got to go to the term beta squared that involves two of these guys. So I have an other oriented loop sitting right here. Let's get it right. And I can cancel this guy, and I can cancel this guy. Whoops, whoops. Well, let's try again. Beta cubed. OK, so I can do, I can take care of this guy. Right? But I'm in trouble. Beta to the fourth, beta to the sixth. My Wilson loop, the expectation of my Wilson loop, only when I go to high enough 
order in the expansion here that I have a, that I have a plaquette term for everybody inside the Wilson loop, do I get something which is non-zero? Okay? So that says the W L and T, L by T, is some number. I can't do the rest of it, but I know there's a beta to the L times T factor multiplying everything. And then there are group theory factors. You guys know more mathematics than me. You can do all the group theory factors. Actually, for U1, there aren't any group theory factors. Hmm, this is interesting. Okay, what is this? Area law. It's an area law. Of course, it's a, yeah, it's an area law. This is e to the minus sigma lt, where sigma is uh, log 1 over beta. That's confinement. Okay, and I did it for u1. Uh, I could, you know. Uh, back in the 70s, there were people that knew group theory, and so they calculated all of these factors for arbitrary gauge groups. This is confinement and strong coupling. This is why, why this paper has got 2,000 citations. Okay? And it's pretty unique. I mean, I mean, it's pretty general, right? There's no fooling around. All lattice gate theories with the Wilson action in strong coupling confine. Okay? It's a simple calculation. In strong coupling. Okay? Um, and also, we have a story here. Okay? Um, confinement, confinement for me is disorder. Okay, in the sense, I mean, look at the strong coupling thing right here. You're integrating over the entire group space. Okay, and basically, this is saying you're sampling everything. And the moment you're sampling everything, you better have a lot of cancellation. So confinement is simply disorder. Okay, you can go high, you can go more highbrow, right? Uh, you know, say for Polyakov's U1 solution, it's a particular kind of order. It's disorder. It's electrical disorder. And blah, 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 it's magnetic ordering, right? You have monopoles. Not here, OK? Uh, well, you take what you can get. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Um, that's way cool. Uh, we have 15 minutes left, OK? Um, that's way, way cool, but your teeth should hurt. You should have a headache at this point. That's an excellent question. Okay, um, so uh, the answer, as far as lattice people know, is that there is a line of, of non-analyticity between a strong coupling phase and the weak coupling phase. This is one of the things that we look for when we do simulations. You have a gauge theory, and everybody confines in the strong coupling limit. And then, if you think that the theory is deconfined, and this is pure gauge theory, let's not let's not put the electrons in. Okay, there must be some kind of a transition. Or a point, a line, you know, some sort of non-analyticity in beta as you move down. And as far as we know, such a thing exists in U1. Okay, the strong coupling phase is uh, is disordered monopole loops, and you can put external bound. Okay, there's a story there. You can't even prove. You can't. You can't rigorously prove any of this stuff. Okay. Yes. 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 Uh, for Wilson action, it's about 1.03. OK? <laughs> Look me up. Go below the papers that are, that are particle data book. OK? There's a paper with Doug Toussaint. We weren't the first people to do that. But uh, there's a monopole paper back there. Yeah. But you could take different actions. OK? So the reason that your teeth should hurt with this story, OK, is that everything that we did right here, OK, that I did for you was a calculation in a Bayer quantum field theory with a particular bear action with a cutoff, right? There's a lot of spacing. In fact, let's go put lattice spacing, let's go put lattice spacings in here to show you what's going on. Let's get the units back in. Sigma is minus 1 over a squared log beta of a when we put lattice spacings back in, OK? <laughs> and the problem is that the lattice spacing is unphysical. It's an ultraviolet cutoff. Okay, and the fact that I chose to use the Wilson action rather than the Lucia Weiss action or the or the Iwasaki action or any of these other actions you've never heard of, that was just some random choice that you know that I made. Okay, so why should you believe any of this stuff? Okay, so that's the next part of the story, and I will start telling you about it right now in the next ten minutes, and then we will continue. Okay, next time.
So this is my version. This is, this is how lattice people uh, think about renormalization and predictability and what it means to produce numbers uh, and how do you deal with cutoffs and things like that. Uh, because I got to say, a big part of the lattice story is uh, the lattice spacing is a fake. Okay? Right? You know, we put it in. Uh, there are people who really believe that way down deep in the world, right, there's this lattice spacing and everything is a Hubbard model or something. But I am not one of these, those people, and I don't think any of them have come to TASI. Um, so we have to address that problem. Okay? So let me. I think what I can do is I can set up the problem and then I can tell you uh, what we start to do uh, and then it'll be 5 o'clock. Okay? So the issue is uh, it's a bare calculation. Okay, so let's go back to basics. Okay, back to basics. Imagine that I have some random bare theory. Okay? And what this random theory consists of is a whole set of coupling constants, okay, and a whole set of operators, and I put an A in here because there's a, there's an ultraviolet cutoff. It's my lattice spacing, okay, and the sum on J is everything which is allowed by symmetries, right? You know, think you know, go back to basics, right? You're not allowed to stop writing down terms. You have to write down everything which is allowed by symmetries, okay? So I can solve quantum field theories, okay? So I go off. And, and I solve this guy, okay? And when I solve it, I pick some random values for the coupling constants. I mean, you know, if I'm going to solve it, I'll just solve it for random values of the coupling constants. Now, if I don't do anything special, if I just pick random values for the coupling constants, what I discover, okay, is that for random CJs, you know, I pull them at random, they're not special, okay? What I find is that my correlation lengths and I'm about to talk about masses, so let's not say the correlation length, but let's say the correlation length on the pseudoscalar channel, the vector channel, the baryon channel, something like that. These are numbers, CK, which are order of the lattice spacing. Okay? Or if I look at masses, masses are 1 over correlation lengths. These are like m, k, a, which are numbers which are order 1. This is for random values of my coupling. I mean, why not? Okay. Um, now, you could object. Suppose that you wrote down some theory, and the theory has a global symmetry, and it's spontaneously, and I have Goldstone bosons. Okay. That's okay. I mean, you have these massless particles running around, but you know there are dimensionful parameters there, like f pi. Okay. So you have these massless particles. But f pi is going to be a number like uh, 1 over the lattice spacing. It'll be an order 1 number. And the top part of the spectrum, the rho mass, you know, all the other stuff that's not Goldstone bosons, that's up there at the cutoff scale too. So, so for random choice of your parameters, correlation lengths, everybody is up at the cutoff scale, right? Nothing is going on, okay? So, and, and, and secondly, second thing that happens is I come along and I change these parameters, okay? You know, I tune everybody, and these numbers change. They're, they're sensitive to what I put in. Now that, think about you know, some random theory. OK, so now let's think. I want to remove the lattice spacing. I want to remove the lattice spacing. I want to take the, you know, I want to get the lattice spacing out of there. Um, what does that mean? Well, what that means is that I want to have physics on length scales that are gigantic compared to the lattice spacing. OK? And I want the physics on length scales that are gigantic compared to the lattice spacing not to depend too much on the lattice, not to depend on the lattice spacing at all. You know, that's how renormalization works. It's a cutoff up in the sky and you calculate things and it doesn't depend on the cutoff. Okay? Um, and I'd like my results to be reasonably independent of the precise form of my Lagrangian. Remember, I've got an infinite number of coupling constants right here. right? <laughs> Right? So it's going to be hard to predict something with, well, I can predict anything. Okay, it's going to be kind of hard to get a postdoc with an infinite number of coupling constants. Okay? So, um, so you have to do several things. Okay? Um, and I'll take it as far as what we do, and then we'll see what the hell we're doing next time. So this is just an engineering thing. 
So the first thing I want to do is I want to put I want to get physics onto scales that are gigantic compared to the lattice spacing. Okay. So what I do is I start tuning these guys, right? So I tune the bare couplings to drive the correlation length large. Okay. And I discover several things happen. Some of these coupling constants I can dial them and the correlation length gets long. Some of them I move them around and nothing happens. It's an experimental result. Okay, I, I, can do, I can solve anything. Okay, so that's the first thing. So I discover that the correlation length here is very sensitive to some of my, uh, some of my coupling constants and it doesn't care about the other ones. And the other thing that happens is when the correlation length gets really long, the correlation length depends sensitively on a few of these guys and it doesn't care about the other guys. Okay, they go away. Physics, okay. I'll go for the punchline right here. So what is physics? Okay, physics is dimensionless numbers, right? You know, unless you do gravity for a living, it's dimensionless numbers. Okay, typically dimensionless ratios of dimensionful quantities. Okay, but the things that I can calculate for you are dimensionless numbers. And so, what you want? This is good because we'll end with uh, wants here. You want to say, as I, take the cor as I take a correlation length to infinity, so let's take a mass rather than an inverse correlation length. So I have some m1 of a times a. These are the things that I measure, goes to zero. This says that my mass is tiny uh, compared to the ultraviolet cutoff you know, in mass units, or ma is small. What I want to do is I, want to, I look at a ratio, say, of two things that I can calculate. Dimensionless ratio of something. Let's take a dimensionless ratio of two masses that I calculated here. Okay? This I calculate, this I calculate. The cutoff scale is the only scale that I have. Right? Everything has been written in units of these guys. And it might be that as, as I take the limit, say, m1a times a goes to zero, it might be that this ratio looks like the following thing. So let's make a plot right here m1a right here, that this ratio, let me cheat and draw things, goes to some limiting value. Okay, Let's write this as m2 at 0 divided by m1 at 0. And then it's got a slope, so there's some order a corrections and some order a squared corrections and so on. It might be that this is what happens. In fact, this is what happens. What are the, so this is my rate, you know, I can solve quantum field theory, so I calculate this ratio, and I'm sitting here trying to drive the correlation length to infinity. What's this? Is this physics or not physics? Better still, what's this? Is this physics or is this not physics? Which is it? It's got an A in it. Which is it? It's 5 o'clock, but I'm not let you out here until you answer. It's not physics, okay? This is the physics. Okay, this is the game that we play. Okay, we tune parameters to drive the correlation length to infinity. When the correlation length is very large, then the things that we can predict are these dimensionless ratios. That's the game that we play. So far, I've presented it as an empirical game, um, but of course, there's a renormalization group story to back it up. I will say two magic words and then stop. For us, the magic words are Wilson and Kogut. There is a famous physics, you've seen it, a famous physics reports articles. All students that come to work for me have to read that article. Right, Mr. Hackett? Okay, good. Yes, okay. They don't have to listen, but I ask them to read it. Okay? So I'm going to give you the renormalization group story next time, and this will give you an idea of the sort of things, you know, the what we are doing when we do these calculations. Because everything done with a lattice calculation comes down to this business right here. And for some theories it's easy. And for some theories, it's not so easy. But this is, this is the big picture. This is what we do. Okay? Good. So we're done.